I'm Thalia Truesdale. Um, I went. I moved to Sawyer's Bar, California, in 1973, and lived there until 1988. And uh, we had to leave because our children were going to be going to um, middle school and high school, and had to. Uh, there's, the school only went through eighth grade. Okay. And um, so we moved there, not knowing what we were going to be doing or or anything we we're just looking for some place free to live and a friend of ours had a mining claim so we moved into this little 10 by 12 cabin and immediately began to become immediately began to become part of the community and i had never really known community before and i became a passionate advocate of community um, uh, everybody knew everything everybody was doing. It was a very, very, very small place, maybe a population of 100 at the most, um, and that's in a big watershed area, so everybody was miles away from everybody else, but we all got together all the time. We all had dinner with another family probably three or four nights a week, always, and all the children were at somebody else's house on Friday and Saturday nights, and sometimes we didn't have our own, but we had somebody else's, and that's just the way it always went. Very, very, very powerful community, and um, mostly hedonists, people who were escaping the city for some reason. Some people were sort of back to the landers, which is what we sort of were. Um, we lived in this little cabin, knew we couldn't have a baby there because it was, well, we had a baby, but we knew we couldn't stay because it was on a, literally on a cliff. Just a little tiny piece of property that, um, like maybe 30 by 20, by 15 actually, if that, and the cabin was just perched on the edge of the cliff. Be on the other side of the river was a waterfall and a sheer rock wall, and there and there were square nails all over there, and and some old few little pieces of boards and some other hardware and doorknobs and stuff. So there had been cabins there too, and it was even steeper than where we were. But there had once been thousands and thousands of people living on the river, and you know getting rich as long, much as they could. And then when the gold played out a little bit toward the turn of the century, the Chinese took over a lot of the mining claims and did a much better job of clean up and got, got quite rich um, with everybody's leftovers, sort of. And, um, and then there was a resurgence during the early 30s, during the Depression. There, there were quite a few people moved back in and the town swelled a little bit more. Um, the town had, at one point it had, doctor's office and houses of ill repute, houses of ill repute and big hotels and um, bars and a bowling alley and um, even electricity for a little while from a, from a town generator. That didn't quite work out because of politically people couldn't figure out who was going to get electricity and who wasn't. So um, anyway, it was a very thriving community and there are other thriving communities up the mountains on, on the gullies and up the gulches and stuff as well. The Forest Service didn't want any of that. They wanted to just control natural resources and not have any people uh, living on Forest Service land, which it all was Forest Service land. Um, there was like one-tenth of one percent of the Klamath National Forest was, was private land, and that included huge logging swaths, too, all over the place. So. Um, so they began tearing down cabins. So they, they had, we had a mineral exam the summer after we got there and we were, we were dredging for gold and we were earnestly dredging for gold. That was sort of our job. And they came down and I didn't tell us, the ranger came down and didn't tell us who he was. And um, just was really friendly and everything. And are you planning to stay, et cetera. And the next thing we knew, we got this notification about a mineral exam. So we contacted miners that we knew on the um, Trinity River and the Clam um, and the Salmon River, and we had a huge turnout of people, m many of whom we didn't even know. We'd only been there about a year, who came to protest, and um, and uh, as it turns out, they got their they had this huge hullabaloo to get their dredge down these cliffs that we lived on down to the river, and um, and they. Um, it turns out that the woman who owned the mining claim we were living on had refiled 
and changed the name of the claim and so the whole thing was null and void. But no claims had ever been declared um, declared viable by the by the ranger and it was up to the ranger to determine what what viable meant. The 1872 mining law says that um, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's it's up to the ranger. So if the ranger is making thirty thousand dollars a year, he thinks everybody should be making thirty thousand dollars a year. Yet we were living on a hundred dollars a month, really nicely. We had no bills, we had nothing, <laughs> so we it was we were fine with that. Um, anyway, they, we did move. We had we did move and 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 um, build our house. They did burn down our house. They burned down every cabin on the river that was on Forest Service land on a mining claim. They didn't want anyone living on a mining claim. You could mine it, but there's nothing in the laws that said you were allowed to live there. So, um, so they just made sure that, that they just, they got rid of the riffraff. They just made sure that everybody was gone. And they tried to eliminate the town, basically. So I became very interested in buildings. And um, the first building that I was really enamored with was a church that was built in 1857 um, on what was then flat ground, but then it was totally mined around it. And it was uh, um, just left on a pedestal, which is where it is today. Just a little plain church. It was lined with muslin on the inside just to make it a little bit brighter, because I guess they couldn't paint it or something. There was a picture. A, a painting that was probably, I don't know, five by ten at least, a huge painting um, in the church um, of the crucifixion and the, the church that owns that building, the Catholic Church in Fort Jones, took the painting out in the 80s for cleaning supposedly and never returned it. They said there would be vandalism. There had never been any vandalism there, including the people who tried to 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 um, dig under the church to get the gold that was left there because like $50,000 worth of gold came out of there oh, wow. in those days and that's when gold was pretty cheap <laughs> so so there was you know there's there's a wealth of money under that church right now um, in, in 1982 we bought an old miners estate um, and really interesting old place up on a again on on cliffs that were literally that steep just a tiny little notch where he could he could build well he didn't build it I don't think but he was a hermit who had lived there from the 1923 until he died in 1982 wow. and um, he had never thrown anything away it was just astonishing what he had his collections of everything were just amazing and for people who live on the river you have to be extremely creative in in what you are how you do things, how you fix your broken muffler, and you know how you f how you make things go. And he was just an incredible tinkerer, so he had all this great stuff. So we inherited, or we bought, all this wonderful stuff, and then we became a um, a resource for everybody on the river who needed a thingamajiggy or who's a maflachet. You know, they could come to us, and we would have it, which was nice. And So um, when this library was being planned, we knew we wanted some community artwork in here. And we talked to Lillian and Marvin Rosenberg. Lillian has been doing this type of, of, of installation art for many, many years all over the country. And um, when the building was begun in 2003, the, the Lillian and her husband Marvin went to the school and had all of the kids um, make a clay piece for this, the walkway outside the from, that connects here from here to the school. Yeah. So once we bought this piece of property, we knew that the connection between the, the library and the school was going to be huge. So um, every one of the staff and children and everybody at the school made a clay piece of something that represented the Applegate Valley to them, an animal or flower or plant or something like that. And they were set in um, cement 
stepping stones like this, and they are all the way along the, along the walkway. And then um, once the library was built, originally this was going to go in front of the circulation desk, but this was a better wall for it. And so Lillian opened up her studio for about a year on Mondays, and anybody who wanted to come could come up and make one of these clay pieces. And she did not want to teach. She just wanted people to just either know what to do or learn from another person there. And so we did, we all sort of, there were maybe two, three, four, or five, maybe eight people there at a time for, the, for a full year making these pieces. And some of us made some leaves and grasses and generic pieces as well as, as other things too. Her husband did the, the, the letter stamping, that's kind of the, his, was his contribution. He also made the sun. Um, some people did the woodwork. They cut, the, cut down the trees. This is from three different trees um, and they slabbed it. Um, it tells the history of, of the Applegate and starting with the prehistory and going through the, the mining and, and the current history. Um, and people could just do whatever they wanted to. This was a, a man who, has, who raised his black Angus, so he, he did his, his black Angus. It was very, very fun, very educational. Um, and, and then we wanted to, I wanted to have this little, this little um, blip about it. And so I contacted all the artists and asked if they could send me some information about their experience. And this book was born. This was, a, I started getting between two sentences and three pages from everybody. And so we included it here with, um, with the photographs of, of each of the pieces. And um, it was a very different experience for everyone. This is exactly what we got. We didn't do any editing or anything, and everybody's story is different, and together it makes this amazing whole. It's just wonderful. And Lillianne um, was um, dying when we did this, and she was 84 and had cancer and was not well at all. And we had a little gathering, and I'm gonna cry, <laughs> and um, gave her the book. It was very heartwarming. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was a wonderful thing, and I'm really happy that we have this here as a history. We have an I Spy for little kids. They can you know, look for the picture of the cow. We have a card that has a cow picture on it, and they can see what they can find, and it, yeah, it's very fun. And that's the story of the mural.